Friday night edition of the Anaheim Calling Podcast. We are here to discuss a thrilling or not so thrilling, if your name is Jake Rudolph, overtime victory for the Ducks, 4-3 to three over their Northern California rivals at Honda Center. Gotta say, this was an exciting one, but again... I'm not Jake Rudolph, so I can't necessarily speak for everyone here. <laughs> uh, it was exciting. There was some up and down action. Um, everyone knows my opinion on the rest of the season, and so this one was not fantastic for anyone who's uh, feeling the same way I am because this um, catapults the Ducks up to t- uh, sixth as compared to fifth. And now they're tied with Buffalo also, who's in eighth or in uh, seventh, not eighth. Um, huh. But the Rangers do have three games in hand. So they're as long as the Rangers win, get three points out of those three games, then they'll jump over the Ducks because they hold the regulation overtime win tiebreaker over the Ducks. Um, uh, oh, how the mighty have fallen. <sighs> <laughs> I just want a fun player next year. That's Cy uh, you're hearing. None other than Jake Rudolph. Having a very difficult time dealing with the Ducks. Being good again I mean, at I'm, the end of the season. Not having that difficult of a time. No, oh, okay. It's not that difficult. Especially no. when you see goals like the first goal of the game tonight. Ricard Raquel just sniping top shelf um, on Aaron Dell. I got to say that first goal... Uh, spurred on by a nice uh, turnover caused by Jakob Silverberg yep. and R- Ryan Getzlaff in the neutral zone. I mean, Raquel just gets the puck, has a second to load up, and goes far blocker on Aaron Dell. That was a beauty of a goal. And it was kind of striking to see that that was Ricard Raquel's 12th goal of the season. I mean, this has really been a down year for Raquel after two really career-setting years. Um, and so I think that from a Ducks perspective, it was good to see him getting back on the scoreboard because he he hasn't had a good season. I don't think that there's really any way to frame it otherwise. A lot of his stats are down, including the goal total. And this was a necessary night, I think, for him to feel good going into next season. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen it since uh, basically Randy, Randy Carlo was fired that... Um... Uh, Ricardo Raquel was put with Jacob Silverberg. And once that happened, they started to kind of get some chemistry and get going. And Jacob Silverberg started getting going. And now we're kind of seeing Ricardo Raquel have a similar type of thing. And maybe that's something, um, they can use moving forward. Maybe that's something that's good to know. Moving forward, those two have some chemistry. Now, I do want to say on Raquel, yes, he's had a down season. Yes, he only has 11 goals and 22 assists, but he's also shooting 6% this season. This this isn't a scenario where his shots are significantly down from previous years. Uh, I know chance-wise he's still doing pretty good also. I don't have those numbers directly in front of me, but I'll look them up in a quick second. Um, but overall, yes, his overall production is down, but I feel like we can almost chalk up this season to, well, bad coach, kind of poor situation, overall poor luck. Right. I mean, I do I do think there there is a little bit to that in terms of the season that he has had. But I think it is at least worth mentioning that a lot of his stats, individual stats are down at five on five, uh, or I should say at even strength. Um, his individual high danger chances for so the chances that he's generating from high danger areas, um, they are down over a full chance per 60 minutes. Uh, the same can be said for scoring chances from any area. Um, his unblocked shot attempt rate is down one unblocked shot attempt. And then his shot attempts per 60 minutes are actually up. <laughs> so the unblocked, um, mm-hmm. or sorry, the, the, uh, just the, the shot attempts from any variety are actually up this season, but There is a bit of a dip in his underlying numbers. Not enough necessarily to crater his goal scoring rates. It is something to monitor, however, because it's not it's not just as if he's getting purely unlucky. Want a random thought though on on this? Let me know tell me how this is Randy Carlisle's fault. Oh no, I wasn't gonna say it's Randy Carlisle's fault. I'm curious to hear this. Wasn't even gonna say that. 
<laughs> so what I was going to say is that uh, remember way back when early on in the season, he had that ankle sprain. Okay. And back then, remember how I had said something along the lines of ankle sprains take a while to recover from. And mm -hmm. granted, he had a lot. He has a lot more kind of um, at his disposal than I did when I hurt my ankle playing hockey. But that <laughs> stuff lingers. Like no matter what you do, mm -hmm. ankles, they typically say it's better to break your ankle than it is to sprain it because a sprain takes so long to fully recover. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering how much of that maybe influences some of those chance numbers. Yeah. I mean, it, there's certainly a lot at play there. Um, I don't, again, I don't think that the drop in his underlying numbers are, are necessarily enough to explain his goal total almost being cut in half. But mm -hmm. that right. being said, I, I, I think that also in an eye test level, he just hasn't really looked as impressive to me this season. Um, I think that one thing that he really established in the last two seasons was uh, just an ability to enter the offensive zone almost at will um, with control of the puck, really able to just carry that puck up ice on his own. And he hasn't really been that guy at times this season. And I think that it's hurt his value. I also think that for whatever reason, he just hasn't really been good on the power play. Um, and so... Anyway, you bundle all the things together along with the struggles of the team, and it's pretty easy to see why um, he has struggled so mightily this season. I think he will rebound next year. I don't think this is this season is some big referendum on Ricard Raquel, but it is something to monitor that he has had a tough season, yep. as it is for any player. And I do um, want to briefly mention his expected goal rates are a little bit off from where they were. The last couple of years, two years ago, he was at 0.85 individual expected goals per 60. Uh, last season, 0.83. This year, 0.77. So not a huge drop-off, but still a little bit of a downward trend. There is definitely something in his game that's more than just him getting unlucky. Again, it's not enough to ex completely explain the drop in production, but it's at least enough to contribute to why he's been just not quite as productive this year. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think that when you're ranking the problems with this Ducks roster, I would not say that he's at the top of that list. <laughs> um, but, however, the big news before tonight, not really news. I mean, for anyone who's followed this team closely, this isn't really coming across as news. But now it is pretty much in writing, almost. Eric Stevens tweeting out a couple things. First off. Uh, that Bomberi said that Patrick Eves has been experiencing some of the similar muscle weakness issues that affected him at the start of the last season. He has not played for the goals for the last while and not with them now. This is actually something that we talked about on the last podcast, um, that Patrick Eves hasn't played for the goals since, I believe, February 23rd. Um, and muscle weakness issues, that, that I mean, that's very specific um, it's not encouraging at all to me. Again, we've been saying this for a while now, and it has been a little speculative, but now it's starting to feel more than speculative, but Patrick Eves might just be done with professional hockey going forward. Yeah. I mean, we saw it in basically this article that came or not article, the, this tweet and kind of the, the quotes from Bob Murray that almost kind of sort of sounds like he might be done. And it kind of brought up this brief conversation uh, John Nojol, I believe, on Twitter um, replied to me saying that basically this trade may be looked at as one of the worst trades um, that Bob Murray has pulled off. And I kind of disagree with that. I think we can make an argument where the extension was not the smartest thing to do. in the Well, they for... just bought really, really high on a guy. Who... But. It was pretty obvious this was not like a repeatable season. Yes, but they bu they bought him as a rental, and he put up 13 goals in 27 games for them. But they also extended him. I that, think no, that no, should be but part I of think the you, equation. I think, no, I think you have to separate it because they a condition of the trade was n in nowhere was an extension part of the condition of the trade. I think if we're purely isolating the trade by itself and looking at the trade, I think the trade is fine. I think the extension is the issue. The extension is really bad um, because... Not only did they buy high on a guy who was having a career year, which is usually uh, <laughs> which is usually kind of a red flag for any player. Definitely a red flag for any players out there. Uh, that was bound to not work out. 
especially a guy who has not been healthy for the majority of his career. Now, let me just go ahead and fix my connection here. All right, we're good to go. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, it, it's not looking good. What do you think the next steps are going to be with Patrick Eze moving forward here? What's think, the likeliest outcome going I, into next season? I think if this is the case where he's having muscle weakness issues um, that affected him early on in the year when he went on LTIR, I think most likely what's going to what's going to happen is he has one more year left on his deal. He's just going to be put on LTIR. He's going to still collect his paychecks. The one thing I'm curious about, maybe they do this because of that, is this is all pure speculation completely. Um, is that if the contract's insured? Because this is a guy that is severely injury prone. So I'm not positive mm -hmm. if they would have paid the premiums to get it insured. That may drive the fact that they end up buying it out because if it's not, then they're going to have to pay real money no matter what. And that lessens the amount by two thirds or sorry, mm -hmm. it lessens the amount by a third. Um, you multiply the contract value by two thirds and that's what you're paying out over double the years. Um, right. So I, I think the most likely scenario is he just gets put on LTIR, gets paid out his final year. Doesn't count against the cap though. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that that is the likeliest outcome as well. The second bit of news is that um, Bob Murray also said that he'll be meeting with Ryan Kessler and his doctors. That would have been actually tonight. Um, so they have already met now, or maybe they maybe they haven't already. Maybe it's a really late night meeting, um, but they are gonna, going to be meeting. Um, they've been discussing with the agent back and forth, and now they will be discussing uh, about shutting him down for the remainder of the season and whether he can play beyond the remainder of this actual year. Um, and so, I mean, it sounds like they're having, quote-unquote, the talk. And I think that this is something that we've been talking about for a long time. And now it seems to be actually happening. The wheels do kind of seem to be in motion for Ryan Kessler potentially not being around for much longer. So, yeah. I mean, again, this is not really, to me, it's not really news because it's something we've talked about for so long. Um, but now it is really being put out there um, that it, that it is actually going to happen. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And if this is actually the case and they're actually having to sit down with, uh, with him and talk to him about potentially it getting, or him uh, being injured and potentially having to go basically retire, um, it may become a more real situation that LTIR, hap LTIR happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of resolution that they're going to reach, but clearly now something is going to have to be done because at this point in time, uh, I, do, I mean, it's, talking about both players, it just it doesn't seem that they can really uh, perform the duties of the job <laughs> moving forward. So we'll have to see. Again, it's not really... A whole lot of hard news, but it is showing that the wheels are at least in motion uh, for both these players' futures to be decided rather shortly. Um, outside of that, not really a whole lot to report. I mean, Brendan Gooley has an oblique injury. Um, Bob Murray believes that he will be able to return before the end of the season. Um, and then Chad Johnson looks like he's working out again. Jacob Larson is coming along and may start skating before probably by the end of next week. Yeah. So not a whole lot going on there. Obviously the Kessler and the Eves news stealing the show, not really any other big notes going into tonight's game. I mean, this was a good one overall. I mean, I would say that it was a pretty back and forth affair. Again, the ducks probably not totally deserving to win tonight's game. However, they do find a way to get it done. Um, if you go to the, early part of the second period, Kevin LeBanc would actually get on the board from the face-off circle. And I mean, again, there's not really a whole lot that you can blame John Gibson for here. I mean, just not totally optimal defensive coverage. Kevin LeBanc is sprung open by some good puck movement by the Sharks. That would make it 1-1 in this game. And this was really back and forth pretty much until the very yeah. end. Yeah, it 100% was. The, both teams were trading some chances. Uh, training some shots. I think overall the uh, the Sharks had the better of the shots and the better of the chances throughout most of the game, but mm -hmm. it's not as if the Ducks were getting completely blown out of the water, um, and mm -hmm. especially when going up against a Sharks team that is very, very good at controlling the puck. 
Right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, again, just a very tightly contested affair. Early in the third period, the Ducks would go on the power play. Jakob Silverberg entering the zone just kind of shuffles it along to Troy Terry down the right wing, who then just rifles it into the slot to Adam Henrik. Henrik simply gets his blade on that pass. There's so much velocity on it that he's able to redirect it into the net. That would put the Ducks up 2-1. to one. Troy Terry getting it done. Hashtag Terry is very good, everybody. <laughs> I love how you've just moved off from Troy Terry is good to Troy Terry is very good. I don't even just, say just, Troy. It just says Terry. Terry is very just, good. Just you, doubling down. You know, what keeps, you know what keeps messing with me as I'm typing it out? Um, mm-hmm. Is that as I'm doing it, I keep wanting to put a second R in very. Troy <laughs> Terry is very oh, good, God. and I can't figure out if I want a single R or a double R there. So, I don't know. People, reach out to me on Twitter. Should it be a single R or a double R? <laughs> Jake is nothing if not consistent. <laughs> um, so, pretty much just a few minutes later in the second period, Sharks go to work on the power play. They're able to work it down low. It comes back out to the point. Joe Thornton, uh, in a very rare sighting, actually takes a shot, a slap shot from the top of the circle. Uh, gets to the front of the net. John Gibson is unable to control that puck, um, and Timo Meyer jumps all over it, buries home the rebound, and that would tie the game with the Sharks tying it up 2-2. Two to two. And then with five minutes left in the third period, Ricard Raquel once again gets on the board his second goal of the game, basically just collects uh, Camp Fowler's dish. This is actually something I talked about last game, is these two not really being able to, to yeah. connect on the one-timer. Fowler just gets it over to Raquel. He makes pretty much no hesitation about this shot, just gets it into his wheelhouse, sweeps it on net, goes through a crowd, through Arendelle, and into the net. A real nice kind of decisive play by Ricard Raquel to give the Ducks the lead. Um, I don't know. I think that if you're looking for positive signs on this Ducks power play, this was definitely one of them moving forward. Yeah. I mean, it definitely was. And we saw some signs of life from the power play earlier on also. We saw Terry make a, go for that cross-ice feed to Raquel again um, from the half board. And that's something that worked a couple games back. And it just mm-hmm. for it ended up on Jacob Silverberg's stick instead of Raquel. But it was the same exact play. And so we saw some signs of life from the, this power play. And the interesting setups that have been rolled out because the power play is nowhere near what it was basically at the end of Randy Carlisle's tenure. All of the units have been completely mixed up with different players right. out there. I mean, the same thing with the penalty kill. I mean, Ricard Raquel is killing penalties. Right. And another thing that I should mention on this power play is that uh, Adam Henrique had a really nice screen on Aaron Dell. I don't mm-hmm. think Aaron Dell was really able to see this puck at all. Um, and so that's, you got to give a little credit there. Now with about 248 left in the third period, uh, Sharks do find a way to tie this game back up. That would be Justin Braun off of a nice feed from uh, Gustav Nyquist. And Mark Edward Vlasic actually fires it wide from the point. And Justin Braun sneaks in, gets the rebound off the end boards, and just slams it home again. Not a whole lot that John Gibson can do here. Nope. That would tie the game up uh, with just a couple minutes left in the third period. And to overtime, we would go... Um, anything to add here about this late tally for the Sharks? Um, nope. I mean, Walensky gets caught a little bit, but that's also just kind of one of those weird bounces where it, it's almost as if you can't fully expect that to happen. It's hard to really predict, and it's one of those where the Sharks other or uh, the Sharks defenseman really just kind of they he read the play perfectly. Um, mm-hmm. Brendan Dillon, right? I'm not going crazy. That's who scored. Justin Braun. Justin Braun, sorry. Justin Braun read it perfectly and jumped up into the play and got himself into a spot to get to the puck and fire it home. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, now, we are going to fast forward to overtime here. Uh, Ducks control the puck early on. Really nice play from Ricardo Kell. Just kind of carries it into the offensive zone with control. Dumps it off to Jakob Silverberg, who is curling in. He gets the puck and then just has all the time in the world to walk it in unloads on that wrist shot goes high blocker on Aaron Dell and that would make it four to three Anaheim ducks take this one they play spoiler to the Sharks who were looking for a big W job security after, after losing to the LA Kings and I don't know again a game that probably the Ducks they didn't play a perfect game 
But at the end of the day, they find they find a way to get it done. And um, I don't know if the pro tank people are left a little disappointed, maybe. Definitely a little disappointed. Um, I think there's a lot of positives in terms of, I think, looking at the, the players. I, I don't think this was that great of a game from the Ducks. I think that there were things that they didn't do a great job of. Um, you look at the chances that on the screen with the heat map. Um, and you can see that the Ducks are kind of interspersed, whereas they allowed a lot of chances from right in front of the goal. You look at expected goals, and up until essentially, basically until they took the 2-1 to lead, they were pretty much even in, inspe in inspe uh, expected goals in all situations. Then basically right, right. when they took the two-goal lead, they essentially sat back a little bit. They allowed the Sharks to have some chances and shots, and then the Sharks scored, and then they kind of were trading chances and kind of even. So outside of that one really good chance that resulted in the Sharks' uh, second goal, they kind of played this game pretty even from an all-situations perspective. And when you go to five-on-five, five, um, it, it's once again, you can see it's pretty even Then near the end of the second and into the third, the Sharks take that advantage. Um, but overall, 1.87 to 1.43. I mean, it was a tight game. And this is a good Sharks team. This is a Sharks team that very – that could definitely or has a shot if they can get some goaltending of winning a cup and the Ducks held with them. So I think if you want to look, if you're not in the tank movement, let's go with that. <laughs> there are positives that can be taken out of this game outside of just the result, because I think the result is not something to really look at anymore. And I've said that for a while. I think the process is more important. And I think overall, there's some definite, definite positives to take out of the process tonight against a very good Sharks team from a tank perspective. This was not good. This was not good at all. So um, the Ducks are now jumped up to uh, – let me go to Tankathon. I actually don't believe they've updated Tankathon yet. But the Ducks uh, jumped to sixth, even though Tankathon is still showing them as fifth. And they are tied with Buffalo now, um, who's in seventh. Two points behind, uh, or whichever way you're looking at it, Edmonton is two points ahead of the Ducks or has two point mo points more than the Ducks. Then you have Vancouver, Chicago, and Chicago, three points more. So right now, the Ducks, from a tank perspective, need to stop winning. So let me ask you this. Yes. Did I miss something? Did Daniel Sprong get hurt tonight? I don't believe so. Did he? Yeah, I don't think so. So, so Daniel Sprong played nine minutes tonight in all situations. Nine minutes and one second. Did not record a single second of power play time tonight. So whatever it is that is currently maybe dissatisfying. He played it. He, he played, he, he played in the third period and late in the third period. Also he did, but nine minutes is not a whole lot. <laughs> I mean, however you slice it, however, uh, there, there were, central, there were, there were a lot of penalties. There were, but nine minutes is not a lot. <laughs> I mean, did not play a single second on the power play. Again, this is a narrative that we have been following the last couple of games. Um, I talked about the last podcast, how Daniel Sprong needs to get more of a chance on the power play. And this game was a clear step in the opposite direction. And so, again, not necessarily sure what he needs to do. Um, to shot, differential, to shot differential was nice for him on the night, though. Yeah. But, I mean, to get back into the good graces of this team, not sure what that's going to require. But right now he is, I guess you could call him into the doghouse. I don't know what really else to call it. Um, a guy who was actually slotted uh, next to Adam Henrique and Nick Ritchie to get only nine or sorry, to get only nine minutes and one second on the night. That's just not a whole lot. Hopefully we can see more of him uh, down the stretch here. I mean, it really looks like kind of looking at the – the time on ice for the game, it really kind of felt like uh, the Getzloff line got a lot of minutes as the game mm -hmm. went along. Getzloff, Raquel, Silverberg. You can see I have it up on the screen. Uh, Richie, Henrique, and Sprong only got 640 of ice time at 5-on-5. Five five. Jones, Grant, Terry, 558. Carter, Shore, Perry, or sorry, Rowney, Shore, Perry only got 730. So overall really the only line over 10 minutes on the night is mm -hmm. uh the raquel gets off silverberg line and going along with sprong jones only played 925 grant 930 terry 949 so i don't really know if we can uh say it's necessarily him in the doghouse as much as it is t 
tonight's game, the minutes were kind of spread out pretty evenly. Right, there but were this a lot is of also game teams. number. This is also game number two of this. This isn't like something new. Um, I just think he's a guy that when the situation calls for it, they're not really afraid to just kind of set him aside. Game, it's not really game number. Um, two. Wait, did this happen last game? And I'm just misremembering. Yes. Yeah, so last game he barely played on the power play and he did not really play well, yeah, all that much. I don't think he's overall. played on the power play that much lately. Right. But I'm yes. And that's what I'm saying okay. is I don't think that that's a positive. I think that he should be playing more on the power play. Um, and he just hasn't been. So I don't know. Make of it what you will, I guess. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, anyway, it's not this big controversy. It's not something that's going to necessarily change this team's future. It's just something to monitor. I just think he should at least be seeing a little more time. Um, anything else you want to make a note of uh, about tonight's game? Uh, nothing really, I think, from tonight's game. Um, I mean, the Sharks are falling. I think that's something I make note They're of. They're falling, yeah. They've They're... lost, what, five in a row? Yeah, I mean they're they're such an interesting team because they 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 have stretches where they look absolutely unbeatable, and then they have other stretches where uh, you know they're they're definitely struggling. So I don't know. I mean they still have ninety five points with uh, yeah seven games left. I think that they're going to be fine. Vegas Calgary is seat. Vegas is inching up on them. Yeah, and uh, Vegas is nine and one in their last ten, um, and so again. People were doubting me a few weeks ago, and I was saying Vegas is very good and could be a dark horse. Here we are. I am only more right now than I was then. That's kind of the norm around these parts. Um, but let's get back to oh. the Ducks, though. I did want to mention that Jakob Silverberg tonight, 23rd goal of the season, that actually matches a career high uh, in goals that he had set two seasons ago yeah. with 23 in 16-17. So he only needs one more to set a career high this season. Not bad for a guy who... Some may expect to fall off with job security all lined up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I and can't... he's also done. He's also done it with. Uh, so in sixteen seventeen, he got twenty three goals in seventy nine games. He has twenty three goals in in basically twelve less games this season. Well, and I think so it's interesting. That's a pretty good sign. You're seeing a spike, which is gonna happen with goal scorers. It's bound to happen when he was snake bitten for a fair amount early on in the season. This regression to the mean. Um, mm-hmm in the positive direction in terms of regression to the mean was bound to happen. And then when you add in the fact that he's playing with more creative players, like a Ricard Raquel, right. like, uh, I mean, I wouldn't throw Devin Shore in that boat, but he, Devin Shore has been good when he's played with that line, like tonight playing with Ryan Getzloff, um, and not having the ghost of Ryan Kessler on a line with him. Um, mm-hmm. that has helped his offensive game significantly. Right. And I mean, I think that, I mean, first off, that's a really big part of it. But overall, I mean, he's on a on, on an 82 game pace. He's on pace for 28 goals. Um, so that's definitely a lot higher than his career high. And yeah, I think that Jakob Silverberg has always been a guy on the Ducks who it feels like, although he's been great in the role that he's been asked to do, yeah, um, there always has felt like there was a bit more of an offensive upside there. And the Ducks are now tapping into it. And I could see him maybe hitting 30 goals in the next couple of years, uh, being put in a more offensive role. I don't think it's beyond uh, the realm of imagination. I think that he has that in him. And I don't know. Again, there were some that were very critical of the signing. I think that's still in a world where the Ducks are rebuilding, retooling. Trading him is probably the way to go. But I think in the spot that they're in, where it does feel like they're going to try to make the playoffs next season, and maybe they even can, um, I think that he is going to be a key piece in that. So, sorry, Jake. I mean, why are you saying sorry to me? <laughs> you know why. Why? Um, no, I, so I think that's kind of it from this game. Um, I did want to make mention, uh, one thing I saw on Instagram that I found was interesting, and uh, I was asked to if I wanted to comment about it on Twitter by Kristen Hammonds. Um, Emerson Edom, and I'll put it up on the screen actually right now for all of you out there, posted this video of him back in a video of, I think it was the 13, 14 season when he got caught in a preseason game by Rafi Torres and essentially shedding light on the fact that uh, more or less, man, more or less that hit on his knee kind of ended his career before it started. He had just come, come off the 2012, 23rd or the 2013 playoffs against the Red Wings where 
Um, he had a pretty good playoffs playing on a line with David Steckel, if I'm remembering correctly. Shout out to Daniel, a member of our staff, David Steckel fan club number one for him. Um, <laughs> and this was supposed to be kind of his breakout year. I remember seeing Emerson even drafted. He was like this big piece of the team moving forward, taken in the first round, the same first round that Cam Fowler was drafted in from Long Beach, California. A lot of hype around him because of that. He scored 60 goals in junior um, in his final year there, and so everyone was really stoked about it. And then he kind of fell off a cliff after this uh, 2013 season uh, or the, and then never really was able to kind of capture that again. He had that nice goal against Winnipeg in the playoffs. Um, mm-hmm. But um, a lot of people thought he was invisible after that, and um, eventually he was traded to the Rangers, never really, really was able to do anything there, never was able to do anything kind of for the rest of his NHL career or AHL career, went over to Europe last year, wasn't really, really able to do anything. And so his career is basically done. And he had this really nice inspirational message, basically more or less saying he's not bitter about not playing anymore. Things happen for a reason. Um, but basically his thoughts are with anyone out there who wasn't able to reach their full potential due to injury. Um, and I just thought it was a really nice message. And I think it was really nice to be able to kind of uh, for him to be able to be in a good spot with his career now being over for a guy that had such high potential, such high hope, honestly, within the Ducks fan base of having a Southern California product being on the ice. And um, yeah, I hope he enjoys the rest of his life, rest of um, his non-playing, whatever. Yeah, he I mean, do- he's only 26. Yeah, whatever he does next. <laughs> Which it's, is it's crazy. Sad. It's sad. It's sad. And it's the reality of sport. And it kind of makes you look at these types of hit and hope that these types of things don't happen in the game. And this is why Rafi Torres got suspended so much because he had these types of hits. And you look at the damage he did on so many people throughout his career and the amount of money he had to give up because of that. And it's such a shame. And it's such a shame that such a player like that was allowed to play the game and, and ruin yeah. other guys' careers. I mean, I think that with um, Emerson Edom, definitely had all the tools, definitely had all the potential in the world if you look at the arc of his career, I mean, the lockout shortened season, 10 points in 38 games for the Ducks. Season after, 11 points in 29 games. Uh, then in the AHL at that time, the Admirals, the Ducks farm team, puts up 54 points in 50 games. So clearly a lot of potential there. And then just 10 points in 45 games. And that kind of started to be the beginning of the end for him as an NHL player, at least. Um, never really put up that many points down the line. Um, <laughs> I mean, you look at last season, goes and plays, tries to play in the Swiss League, doesn't put up any points in five games, and then this year gets nine games in with the Ontario reign of the AHL and puts up one goal in nine games. So, look, I mean, obviously the injury is going to have a big effect there, but at the same time, I don't know if that necessarily was the only factor in him not panning out as a prospect, but when you get such a big injury early on, probably doesn't help either. Whatever it was, it didn't work out for him. But again, I mean, I think that you got to look at it positively. Certainly afforded him a lot of opportunities. Yep. Definitely changed his life. Um, I, it just seems like he's, a, he's in a good place, and uh, that's all that we really care about at the end of the day. Yep, agreed. So the best to him. Hopefully there's not, there's always going to be injuries that happen in a contact sport, but hopefully um, it doesn't happen as much. Um, so let's move on to some questions. So we got a question and I got a question in a DM from uh, Joe at don't duck up ask, could you see Murray sending assets to another team to take on Kessler's contract instead of buyout slash LTIR a la pronger dat suit? Kind of like other, the other question, Ari, the Cicerelli Callahan on the jet, uh, when we talked or after the Jets game, um, do you think that the Ducks would do that? I could see that as a possibility. I don't think it's the likeliest scenario, but I do think that there, there is probably a world where that is a possibility. The thing is, is that I don't see Bob Murray really being that keen on giving up something of value just to have a team take yeah. this contract off, off his hands. The thing is, is that the, the the Kessler contract is not such a pariah that you would be willing to give up a uh, prospect or a pick just to have a team take it off your hands. Um, again, though, I mean, it depends what the price is, because if the price is palatable, again, all of the cap remedies that the Ducks have at their disposal 
short of a retirement, don't fully take it off the books. So if you can trade him, you're just completely done with all the cap ramifications. So I guess that this, it is something that they would have to consider just because out of due diligence, it is a scenario where they just don't have to deal with the contract any longer once the trade is completed. Yeah, I, I don't see it really happening. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, um, uh, especially if they can put it on LTIR. The only reason why they would possibly trade it is if it was like a Nathan Horton situation. I know it's something we're never going to find out, but then whether it's insured or not, because if they can put it on LTAR, they're getting the cap savings. Um, they're still paying the money. And so that would be the only reason is if it, they're not getting any insurance money and it makes it worth it to try to move it off the books along with a pick or a prospect. I don't see them doing it. The only way I would see them doing it is it, if in the next three years, uh, while that contract is still on the books, they end up somehow uh, contending and want to move that money off the off the salary or basically off their books. Um, I don't foresee them doing that if they're in a rebuild mode because a lot of times teams that are rebuilding try to get under the cap a little bit more, retooling like they are. Um, and, uh, do, do, do. and so that would be the only situation. And then the other question was, who's the most likely winger to be moved? We have about eight to nine wingers worthy of top nine with only six wing spots in the top nine. And he mentioned when you, uh, when Felix mentioned his pro projected lineup, he didn't mention Silverberg until the fourth line. He won't be <laughs> traded, but it shows how much overflow there is. All right. I mean, that was more of just me kind of spitballing in that moment, not really having it in front of me. Um, Yes, yeah, Silverberg, I think, is obviously fully in this team's plans. But this is something we've been talking about all season long, is that this team has a lot of options on the right wing. Um, you know, once Andre Kasha comes back, especially, uh, that log jam is only going to continue. But, yeah, I mean, it's going to be an interesting training camp going into next season because they're going to have a lot of decisions to make in terms of fleshing out the roster here. Yeah. Yeah, they, they definitely have it. I mean, name name one winger who you think is the most likely to be moved. Um, most likely to be moved? Oh, geez. I mean, one name that I would... I mean, this is something that we've kind of speculated on. Again, I don't see it totally happening. Um, you know, with Ricard Raquel, he is a guy who has a lot of value. Probably the most value of anyone in this Ducks lineup. And so I... I don't think it would be unreasonable for the Ducks to at least put his name out there and see what they can get. Um, outside of that, though, I don't necessarily see any big trade pieces. I think they're going to give Daniel Sprung at least one more more, more a year. Um, and then after that, I don't think that Patrick Eves really has any value right now on the trade market. Then you really have to go deep. I don't see them moving any of their prospects. Corey Perry is untradeable. Um, and so really, and Jakob Silverberg is locked up. So to me, the only guy, and this is, sounds so weird, but the only guy I could realistically see getting traded would be Ricardo Kell, but I don't really expect that to happen. I mean, maybe Sprong. Maybe Sprong, but the thing is, I just don't think he has really any value right now. Um, I don't, I, I mean, he did put up a bunch of goals with the Ducks, but, um, I think that my question would be, if I'm a, a GM involved in this deal, it's like, well, he just scored a bunch of goals for you. Why are you all of a sudden looking to trade him again? Uh, what's going on there? And I just I just don't see him having a ton of value. Whereas if you're looking to trade a Raquel, again, not that I think that that's advisable, but he is probably the one winger on this lineup right now that can bring you anything of value. Yeah. Uh, so Kessel Scott on Twitter also asked, uh, do you think Manson's injury, or Manson is playing through an injury right now? I don't think so. I mean, again, it's so hard to speculate with these things, but I think that he's actually played pretty well um, since being reunited with Hampus Lindholm. Yep. So, no, I, I wouldn't uh, think so. Ken Pafu in our Twitch chat uh, makes it an interesting point. Sprong might be just be insurance for Kasha's unfortunate, inevitable uh, next injury, unfortunately. I think that's jumping the gun a little bit, but I think the idea of him being here kind of as extra firepower if you need it might be an interesting thought. I mean, he is cheap for next year. He is going to be cost controlled as an RFA. Um, he is still young and can develop. I that may be the the reason for keeping him and not moving him right there. Um, right. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that they moved a guy in Pedersen to get more offensive depth because that's not something they really have in spades. So I don't know. I mean, I don't think this is. I think caution may be part of it, but I think that they just realized, hey, we need more 
guys up front who can potentially score goals for us. Yep. All right. So uh, let's jump into questions from the Twitch chat. So for those of you out there that are watching the live stream, start throwing your questions into the Twitch chat. For those of you out there watching this on YouTube, yes, we do have this cha- this show on YouTube. Um, uh, we do have the show on YouTube. We do have it on podcast services. Um, so for those of you out there, we do a live stream at twitch.tv slash Anaheim calling SBN where you can watch and interact with us live. You can subscribe to the channel and, uh, it actually helps out a lot. And if you have Twitch prime, you do have Amazon or if you have Amazon prime, you do have Twitch prime. And with that, you can subscribe to this channel for free, which helps us out a fair amount. And by subscribing, you get a special badge next to your name, a special, uh, special emotes in the chat. And it's a really good time. So let's jump into some questions. So where was this one? Uh, Alice underscore a 33. And this is not exactly a question about the game, but said, how's the podcast for tomorrow going to work? So we're going to have a special, uh, all of us in one room podcast where you're going to have me. You're going to have Felix. You're going to have CJ. You're going to have George and you're going to have JC. All of us on a couch, probably jumping in and out after the watch party, uh, doing it afterwards. So it's going to be a little bit of a late one, but it's, probably gonna be a fun one and one that uh we've actually never done a full pod with all of us in the same room should be interesting absolutely are you you look like you're not that excited about trying to keep everyone in line you're gonna Um, you're gonna be the ringmaster i think i think live pods are always very good so i have no complaints there as the person that does the recap you have to be the ringmaster (laughs) <laughs> no i have i have no qualms there uh so uh uh bob shockey asked can holzer be traded uh i mean his contract's up after this year i don't know if they'll even resign I, him i, I mean, don't i don't see him coming back yeah Let's just and so trade way. isn't a trade's not a thing he he's been a good foot soldier for this team he's been fine for them he's been the solid six seventh defenseman um has always done what he's asked of and i think i'm gonna look back as a person on him fondly. I don't think he's ever made a huge impact on the ice personally, but uh, yeah. So where we go, where do we go? Uh, Varluna asks, what do you think of the, de- or the defense pairs will look like next year? Um, I mean, barring any big trades, I think that they're going to be really similar uh, to this year. I think that um, if you look at, the way it's shaking out, I think that Lindholm and Madsen are going to remain together. Um, I think that Cam Fowler and Jacob Larson are probably going to be split apart. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who claims that third pairing right the right side spot. I think Gooley and Fowler are probably going to be together to start at the beginning of next season. I don't know if that's necessarily the long-term plan. It's going to be interesting. I could see a little movement um, on the Ducks back end. Um, I don't necessarily see Jake Dotchin starting the season on the third or second pairing. Maybe I could be wrong about that if he has a really strong training camp. Uh, but most likely to me, I think that it's going to be some combination of Lindholm, Manson, Fowler, Gooley, and Larson. And then from there, probably add in another D just to, well, obviously you have to add another one, but someone uh, to round out the third pairing. That would be my guess. I think that they're probably going to bring in an outside uh body just to round things out yeah i definitely kind of agree with that because they're sitting one defenseman short i think as of now um so let's go with this question ken pafu said if they do get rid of eve's kessler contract do you think bob murray makes a move for a big almost franchise player for the push next year no i don't think so they'll have a lot of they'll have a lot of cap space yeah, but I think that right now they can just sit on their cap space kind of as an as an asset in and of itself. Um, I think that the wise thing to do, obviously, if a deal presents itself, you make it. But I think that for them right now, it's more about just making smart, calculated moves for the long term, uh, using that cap space effectively, not necessarily just using cap space for the sake of having it. To me, this is kind of what the Canadians have done in the last uh, two years. They've had a lot of cap space and they haven't gone out and spent it just because they have it. To me, um, we've seen teams do this in the past where just having it can be a weapon and you can 
solve other teams' problems. You can um, just have more flexibility. And I think that to me, if I were Bob Murray, I would be very loath to give that up unless I had a really good deal on the table in terms of acquiring a player. Um, so I don't see the Ducks going out and making a big splash just to add a big name player unless it's a guy who really falls into their timeline. Uh, right. So let's say it was an offer sheet for a Braden point or something like that. I don't see them just going out and getting a veteran, something of that nature. Yeah. Yep. And how would you feel if they went after our Tommy Panarin? Um, I think it makes sense. I mean, yeah. Artemi Panarin, he, if, if you look at kind of the timeline that he provides, I mean, he is not uh, a guy who's, I mean, he he's not a guy who's on the wrong side of 30. He is 27, so it's not as if he's uh, some spring chicken. Um, but I would say that he is a guy who you could bring in, and he at least fits the timeline of kind of moving things forward right now. And he also presumably is going to be good for the next three to four years. And so I would not have a problem with that. I don't know if they'll be able to afford him because I feel like he's going to cost a boatload of money <laughs> for whatever team ends up signing him. But I don't think that that would necessarily be a bad move for the ducks again, because a, he's just really damn good. And B, I think that he kind of fits the timeline that they're pushing for right now. Yep. Uh, fired Carlisle asked, uh, do you think they re-signed Jake Dotchin this summer? I believe he is an RFA, but seems to be low in the depth chart. So let me actually. I think he's been. I think he's been fine. I mean, he's been serviceable in San Diego. It kind of depends who is going to be coaching that team next year. If it's not going to be Dallas Akins, but I could see him coming back. I can't see a lot of interest around the league for him. To be honest, I don't think he's necessarily rehabilitated the value that he once had. That being said, I do still think that he's a fine depth piece. He's looked okay um, in different stints in Anaheim. But I I don't really see him going anywhere uh, unless the Ducks just choose not to qualify him or something like that. Uh, yeah, he's an RFA with arbitration rights, so yes. most likely he's going to get a minimum contract if they want uh, to keep him. Uh, because at this point, he's just kind of grateful that a team picked him up in the first place. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, what was it? There was another question that I saw. Uh, there was something else I wanted to bring up. Oh, here's what I wanted to bring up. So now that we've kind of talked about that, and I don't really see. Any other questions in the Twitch chat? Um, I did want to make mention of a few things. Um, first off, on Sunday, we have the Podcast Classic. Mm -hmm. And I am very, very excited about this. So at Lakewood Ice at noon, your boys right here, <laughs> me and Felix, and on our line will be, uh, will Dan, be Elder. Dan Elder. We will be taking on Team Totally Offsides, all your favorite people from Anaheim calling, from me, from Felix, from CJ, from JC, from and even George. Even George will be on the ice. How long he's on the ice, we don't know. We'll find out as the time goes on. Um, but uh, we will be taking them on on Sunday. And thank you to Scott Watherspoon, Kestrel Scott, our good friend out there, for putting together the trophy for the game. <laughs> And yes. I'm trying to find it very quickly. Uh, we put it out on Twitter. Here it is in all of its glory. Here it is. The annual, actually possibly monthly, who knows, Podcast Classic St. Jared Bowl Memorial Trophy sponsored by Dump and Chase Hockey and Cinnamon Toast Crunch. And then Scott added no socks allowed at the end. <laughs> this is all to commemorate the fact that Jake plays hockey barefoot. And does not wear any socks in his skates. No, regrets. which is actually not not that controversial. It really I mean, isn't. I, I don't understand how it, it's become this controversial of an opinion. <laughs> I mean, it made its way onto the trophy. But yes, that's going to be Sunday at Lakewood Ice. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very excited. Uh, Team Anaheim Calling had a very intense training session Sunday night uh, at KHS Ice Arena. Jake, CJ, Dan, and I uh, got into it in a three on three pickup and. We went at it for almost two hours. So, um, how many goals did I score, Felix? I actually didn't count. I think I'm not really in, in the business of counting I, your stats I in think, a pickup game. I think it was this many. <laughs> I think it was this many on a goal on a goalie. Uh, yeah, we actually had a really good goalie in our pickup session. Uh, I unfortunately didn't get his name, but that guy was really freaking good. Also, had not what I appreciated about him was that he didn't have 
the fanciest gear, the newest gear. He had a really old school beat up Vaughn catcher. And instead, he was just a guy who got the job done. I can always appreciate that uh, from a goalie. Okay, so we're actually running out of time here. My recording device is about to run out of battery. So very, very briefly, we have the the watch party tomorrow. Also, um, if you are a patron, you can come. It's going to be for patrons only. Please, if you're going to come, let me know in a comment on the Patreon post. Um, Also, on that post, you'll find out the location, the time, it's going to be a really good time. You'll ha- have a lot of us there. It's going to be very, very, very fun. Um, we'll be watching the Ducks-Kings game. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited for it. Absolutely. Um, that's patreon.com slash acpod. Make sure to check us out on the Apple uh, podcast app. Just leave a rating and a review. No new reviews to speak of here, but we did get a couple recently, and we do read them on the show. We really do appreciate your feedback. Um you know, you taking the two minutes out of your day to write that, it really does go a long way uh, for us to grow the show. Um, now, of course, make sure to subscribe on Twitch. If you haven't already, Jake gave the spiel, but I'm going to give it again one more time. That's twitch.tv slash Anaheim calling SBN. Um, if you are already an Amazon Prime member, you actually get a free Twitch Prime membership. So make sure to take advantage of that. Um, totally worth it with the live uh, broadcast after the game. You get a actual broadcast chat so you can interact with everyone else it's a lot of fun um honestly kind of makes this experience for a lot of people so i definitely recommend it jake we also have a youtube channel i think you already spoke about that yep. if you want to break it down a search out anaheim calling sb nation on youtube you'll find the channel all of the you recorded versions of our twitch streams are put up there um, if you want to go ahead and comment on the video, I will go ahead and take a look at those comments after the fact and interact, reply, whatever you want. So if you have anything that you want to comment on, please leave it in a comment and I'll reply. So, yep. Absolutely. And make sure to check us out on social media. Jake is on there on Twitter at reindeer games 91. I'm on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard. And of course, Anaheim calling.com at Anaheim calling on Twitter. So, That is going to do it for us tonight, guys. We will be coming at you live tomorrow night after uh, the Ducks take on the Kings. So that should be a good one. And then, of course, we have our podcast classic on Sunday. So it's going to be a busy weekend for the Anaheim Calling podcast. And we will talk to you then. Thanks for listening. Bye.